All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us live. And for those who will be watching the recording, thank you to you as well for taking the time to review our meeting tonight. We will cut down on the number of plays tonight. Uh, we're going to be much more topical than we have been in the past tonight. Um, we're in the backstretch now. We're coming down to the wire. We've got two weeks to go in the regular season and then um, we'll be hitting the playoffs. So we have to be at our best. And uh, the way that we are at our best is if we prepare properly, stay in the moment, make sure that we don't change things that have been working for us all year, overemphasize our communication, um, make sure that we help out when and how we can. So those will be uh, what, will, what will make the difference for us um at those key moments so we're we're going to start out and uh very rarely do you see any college video from me primarily because we have so much good video that comes from our various uh assigning groups um uh, so but there there was we've talked about catch no catch it it different times during the season and looking back on it, we probably should have spent a little more time with this uh, during the preseason. But we've talked about concepts such as firm control. Um, if you're going to the ground, you have to survive the ground. If you're near a boundary, you have to get a body part down and you have to satisfy those other requirements. If you're out in the field, you have to have firm control. And we've talked about the concept of doing something common to the game. So this first clip is from uh, Ferris State University and Roosevelt University that was played a week ago. And what we're going to get is we're going to get a catch down here on the lower left, or we're going to get a catch, no catch um, situation. We're going to, the runner goes and that ball comes out pretty quickly. Now we're going to get multiple views here. So uh, let's go to the end zone view. This is eventually recovered in the end zone for a score. Now, what you're going to see is that the receiver, this is close, like most of them are, but you can see that the receiver in this particular case has firm control of the ball, turns, but the point that I want to point out to you is when we think about things that are common to the game, Notice that with the left arm, he attempts to stiff arm his opponent. That is an act common to the game and indicates to us that therefore, because he is performing an act common to the game and has firm control of the ball, that this is indeed a catch and a fumble. Um, now, the only thing that I would take uh, issue with here from a seven-person mechanic standpoint is you're going to see that the short wing um, is going to move up rather than towards the goal line. Now, if this is a five-person game, this is absolutely correct mechanics, but in seven, knowing that you have the deep wing, what you need to do is to get that beanbag out and then you need to make your way back towards the goal line. This ball is loose in the end zone. Several hands are on it. And eventually we have firm control in the end zone. You'll see the referee and the short wing on that side take their time. They don't rush to a judgment. Uh, they make sure that the play finishes properly. Um, you know, we may potentially have had a player that was out of bounds there. We don't get a look at that, unfortunately, just by angles. Um, but they take their time. They find a player in possession of the ball. It happens to be a player wearing a white shirt, and they ring up a touchdown. But the point of the matter here is firm control, enough firm control, that this player was able to do something common to the game and therefore the correct call was fumble or catch fumble eventually recovered in the end zone now you can see the deep wing and the back judge are moving up slowly they're letting this thing settle and now eventually we're going to get to a point where there's going to be a conversation and they're going to work their way through this and stick with the ruling on the field which is catch fumble now, like most of the catch, no catch situations we've shown this year, 
This is close. There's no doubt about it. But really what sells the deal here is to our end zone view when you can see where this player um, has firm control and then attempts to stiff arm the opponent. One more time and we'll move on. Turns up field, attempts to stiff arm, defender gets the ball, gets the ball out with a arm to it. Um, now it doesn't look like that player out of bounds actually touched the ball, but we know, or we should know, that if that player who does go out of bounds touches this ball while it's loose, the status of the, the ball is out of bounds. And then we would have to make a determination what caused the ball to end up in the end zone. And hopefully you would agree with me that the impetus here is the fumble. Even though it is muffed around, the, the impetus is the fumble, which means that team A is responsible for the ball in the end zone. So had team A recovered this ball, this would be a safety. So good play to learn from, good play to talk about, but not one of those things from the standpoint of a stiff arm that typically you think of as a football move. All right, Gregor, uh, let's go to the KOA next. All right, we're gonna take a look at uh, some clips that involve uh, kick returners. And this probably is something that uh, came about like most things. Uh, from football clinics uh, where coaches go and they they learn certain things that um, presenters give to them. Uh, because this year, uh, I've seen more than I can remember in a long, long time, a lot of pointing at the ball, right? So here you can see the up back points with his hand clearly above the shoulder. Now, as a result of this signal above the shoulder, we're gonna recognize that as an invalid signal. We're not gonna foul it. We're simply going to, at the end of the play, we're going to shut it down when this ball is recovered. Now, in this particular case, it's pretty deep. The kick return has to go inside the five. Um, and we'll get to some processes here in just a minute, but I want to show some examples of what you need to be prepared to deal with for the rest of the season. Not that you haven't seen some of it so far, but it just seems like recently we've seen more of it. All right, so there's the first one. Clearly the up back is pointing and his point towards the ball or back to the kick returner is above his shoulder. Now we're not going to nitpick the shoulder. If it's close to the shoulder, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But clearly, clearly this hand is up around the helmet. So we don't have the latitude to do anything other than to recognize this as an invalid signal. All right, next clip. All right, here's another kick. Same team receiving. Now, did you see that? that arm movement by the player that ultimately catches this ball. Go back and look at it again. This ball goes up. Now, probably what he's doing is he's telling his partner, I got it, I got it, I got it. But the problem is he puts his hand up above his shoulder. So this is also a signal that we need to recognize as being um, a fair catch signal. In fact, if you want to avoid the, the whole notion of, well, then it ought to be a foul, just simply say that the hand above the helmet is recognized as a fair catch signal. Then you don't have to argue about whether there's a foul attached to it. But, and again, when we get through this vignette of uh, a few plays, we're going to talk about some cons to see the the kicking team player says, hey, you know, he's signal for a fair catch. That's exactly the point. All right, next clip. All right, there. Hand is below the shoulder, all right? Everything is below the shoulder. Now, there's no return here. Uh, but when we have action, um, 
where we keep our arms below the shoulders and we simply point. If we have any waving factor, that's also going to be a signal, but simply pointing at the ball is not going to cause this to become automatically dead. All right, I believe there's one more here, Gregor. Number 51. Okay, we're pointing, we're pointing, we're pointing. Um, and if you go back, you'll see that the point is a little bit high, but there's no waving. Go back one more time. Maybe we can see it from this angle, Gregor. See, his hands get pretty high there. So when he gets above, above the shoulder, we're going to recognize that as a fair catch signal. All right, so what do we do about it? Two things. All right, you can stop the video for just a minute, Gregor. Uh, two things. Here's what you need to do. First of all, referees in your your pregame meeting with both of the head coaches, you need to bring up the aspect that we're seeing more and more of this. Um, and that the only thing that a kick returner can do that will not cause the ball to become dead is to point at it. And the point has to be at the shoulders or below. Any pointing with waving is going to be recognized as a fair catch signal. It's going to become dead. Anything above the shoulders, pointing to a teammate, pointing to the ball, whatever is the same thing. And we want to make this as simple as possible. And if you get some chin music back, all you need to say is, Coach, the same principles apply to your opponent. And we're going to cover that with your colleague next when we go to him, or we already covered it with your colleague in a previous conversation. Then the second point, and this is for the deeps, while they're out there and they're doing their kicking drills and the kick returners are fielding the ball, we need to go to those people and find out who it is that's going to be back there. And we need to, need to make sure that we communicate clearly with both teams and their kick returners that any arm movement other than below the, below the shoulders with a point is going to cause the ball to become dead if they recover it. That's all you need to do. You've got it covered from both teams, and that way everyone will know what to expect. And then the third piece, if we do have a signal that we recognize is killing the ball, let your referee know what happened, and then referee flip on the microphone and simply say, uh, the ruling on the field is that an invalid fair catch signal or a fair catch signal was given, and by rule, the ball is dead or it is recovered. So you need to prepare uh, from three points of view, and that will cover it. And that way, hopefully, we can avoid problems that might otherwise uh, rear its head. Any questions on that? Rich, we got hopefully one. Hopefully that's helpful. Yep. We got one uh, from Damon. Uh, in a five-person crew, can the short wing kill the play if they know this an invalid fair catch? Uh, it it needs to be the the short answer is yes, but you better be certain. Okay, there can be no question about what just happened there. It can't be well. I thought or it looked like no. This is what the kick returner did. If not, then don't get involved in it because we don't want to be making assumptions and making poor choices. Okay, now. At the end of the play, like let's say you're a deep point or you're a short wing and you, you think you saw something that concerns you, at the end of the play, you can still come in and say, hey, Rich, did, did you see anything that looked like uh, something above the shoulder? Um, do we need to consider bringing this back to where the recovery was made? We can have that conversation. But let's just make sure that we don't have regrets because, well, and then afterwards we realize that, well, I guess I really didn't see the whole thing. Good question, Damon. All right, so let's continue with the KOA. All right, so what we have here is we're going to have a pass that is going to go downfield. First of all, we're snapping from about the 30. So 
in five person mechanics, we know the back judge is going to start somewhere around the five and then is going to have to make decisions about what to do, whether the goal line is threatened. If it's not, then he needs to clearly get back to or at least towards the end line to defend the end line. Now, in seven person, you know that you have deep wings that are going to be at the goal line. So back judges, when in doubt in seven, if you're not certain where that ball is going to come down, start giving some ground into the end zone, knowing that your colleagues are going to have the goal line covered in the event that we have something close. Here, the back judge, this is a five-person game, right where he belongs, pass is intercepted in the field of play, which, by the way, potentially we could have had a momentum. There is something that we've not talked about this year. Um, this is probably intercepted at about the one and a half. And we don't want momentum inside the one for sure. So anything that's that close when you've got the player going to uh, in retreat mode, like what we have here, we would recognize that as being in the end zone and a touchback if applicable. Um, here, the ball is intercepted, and because the player comes out, momentum would be off anyway. Now, momentum, we're going to put a beanbag down at the spot where possession changes. Most times, it's an intercepted pass, but it could be on a fumble, could be on a backward pass, could be a number of scenarios where um, the goal line could be involved and we're not going to have a safety if the if team B ends up in possession of the ball in the end zone. So just a, a good reminder there for back judges, something to talk about during your pregame this week in terms of making sure that, yes, we have the goal line covered, but when in doubt, our back judge is going to make sure that he's prepared to defend the end line if it is challenged. All right, next clip. All right, so what we're going to get, we're going to get a play that's going to come towards the uh, left side of the screen, bottom left. Pretty typical jet screen. Now, the, the point in question is the block that occurs uh, by, I believe it's the slot receiver. He's going to go down. No, the, it's the player coming from the inside. I uh, can't, maybe number six, this player that is, uh, um, I believe he's the slot back right now, just outside the tackle. Now, when we talk about foul selection, when we talk about quality fouls, yes, we want them to be big and we want them to be obvious. Now, in the case of blocks in the back, uh, it does not take much contact to throw a player off of a path where he would be able to make a tackle. And that's indeed what happens right here. Now, this was a five-person game. Uh, the referee picked this up. Now, um, normally I'd want the referee working the, the lineman from the back side, knowing that the umpire is going to work the, the lineman from the front side. But for whatever reason, he goes out and apparently sees this block beginning to end. And this is a correct call. Now, in seven person, um, this is deep wing all the way. This is deep wing 101, all right? Because clearly the, the widest receiver that started out being our key is going to be handled by the short wing. So now we need to check down. And actually, our back judge, in addition, should have looks at particularly this block in the back. But let's not get totally hung up deep wings on the block that's occurring at about the 10. We also need to keep our vision wide enough that we can see the other block because the first block that is ends up being the IBB is the one that's at the point of attack first. So in terms of prioritizing our blocks, the number one block would be the one at the top of the numbers. And the second one would be the one that would come later in the blocking pattern, which is the one that would be ideally 
um, your initial key as a deep wing. Keep in mind, in a, in a reason why deep wings that we have to look beyond just our initial responsibility is look at the traffic that potentially gets in front of the back judge. Back judge may not have a clean look at that block. So we need to be prepared to support um, a foul if one is necessary. And even though the, I would not ask the short wing to, to be responsible for that block. He has to make sure that this is a forward pass. He also needs to make sure that we have firm control. So this is a block that has to be picked up by back judge and deep wing. All right, next clip. Okay, this is clip 75, so it's middle of the game, and here we go. And I didn't warn you about it on purpose, because you're not going to be warned about it in a game. And by now, if you had any experience with this program, you know our mantra about free kicks. We just can't be surprised. Uh, we've got to be prepared to work every free kick as a short kick, and sure enough, here it comes. Now, they probably saw something on film um, that led them to believe that they could be successful with this kick. Um, now, because the ball travels the required 10 yards, um, it's the strong survives here. Now, that doesn't mean that players can't be fouled. If there's blocking involved, it has to be above the waist. Uh, certainly, there could be targeting. There could be a number of fouls that would occur here. But just on the basis of, for instance, not being able to block until you're legally able to touch, that's not a factor here. So we've got to be prepared to work this play. And we're not working it with six in the box. We're working it with our typical four. So at the end of this play, if there's some doubt whether you're the umpire or the back judge, you need to come in with your information and ask questions if there's some doubt in your mind in terms of what happened. Now, we have to be careful that we don't close down too quickly and assume that this ball is recovered. I think we get a little bit of nervous feet here. We leave our sideline really before we're certain that we have a firm control and recovery. We're on our way in as that kick is going. And that's never a good idea. So we have to make sure um, that um, that uh, we don't move in too quickly. Now, this is a grounded free kick. So I don't believe that we have uh, KCI as a factor here. Um, if it was airborne, then the person that put in the chat, you know, what about KCI? Absolutely, that could be a factor. And we know that uh, regardless of whether there's a team B player in the area or not, they can't catch the ball on the fly. All right, next clip. This has got to be part of your preparation, though. Right, now that looks like an ugly hit. Now, fortunately, we have two views of this. So let's look at it from the uh, sideline view again. You can see that this player is vulnerable, uh, clearly defenseless. And he takes a big hit. All right, so you, you might be thinking, well, this could be targeting, this could be a high hit which by Federation rules could be a foul. But as we look at it now from the end zone view, we can see that this player pretty much goes right on by this guy and contact is at the shoulder pad level, shoulder to shoulder here. So let's talk about this from a mechanical point of view. Let's say that our short wing or our umpire or anyone on the field dials this up and throws a flag. All right. First of all, we're going to ask the question, what do you have? 
And then we need to work through the play in terms of, for instance, I would think that the back judge would be in an ideal position to look at this and be able to say, wait a minute, okay. Uh, first of all, you don't have targeting because the, the, we don't have forcible contact above the shoulders. Um, and in terms of whether this is a high hit or not, this is shoulder pad to shoulder pad. And I did have a look. Yes, it's a big hit, but this is one that we really ought to pick up because this is just a, a hard hit, a football play, um, and one that we just need to play on. All right, next clip. What we're going to get is a catch towards the bottom of the screen here, and the nature of the catch puts the runner down. The knee goes down, all right? Now, this is not a vicious hit. And, you know, I can I can support not having a foul. But if you put one down there just from the standpoint of it's the responsibility of this defensive player to be able to recognize that a knee is down, um, you would be supported. This... Uh, this is one of those 50-50 plays. Um, fortunately, it's not too vicious. I think the the second player in has second thoughts about it after the fact. Um, so I can I can go along with all right. There was question. He comes up, uh, finishes the guy off, and okay, maybe there is question is in his mind in terms of whether the knee is really down. But anything more in terms of timing or anything more in terms of severity of the act, uh, this is one that we really should have a foul on. All right, next clip. What we're going to get on this last clip out of the KOA is we're going to get a block from the top of the screen coming down. And you can see that the, the slot back um, even delays um, his timing because he's waiting for the runner to get outside. But clearly this is a blindside block. This guy cannot see this hit coming. Um, that's one that we need to ring up as blindside block um, just from a safety standpoint. And the thing is that this player could very easily make this illegal block by leading with his hands. So good foul down, good to get. All right, let's transition now to the MHSAA. Got about 10 clips there, and then uh, I'm going to make some concluding comments, and uh, we're going to call it a night. All right, now this first clip uh, is going to go along with the theme of personal fouls. And what you, what you can see here is this play is broken up downfield. Uh, go back, Gregor. This becomes an incomplete pass. It certainly could have been intercepted, but you can see that a hit comes by a defensive player, and clearly it, this player uh, should have known that this pass was not going to make it to the receiver. This is... You know, it's intercepted in front. There's no attempt whatsoever to minimize contact. In fact, if anything, uh, adds to it. And this is a UNR foul that we want called. All right, next clip. We're going to look at some, uh, some mechanics now. Um, we Stop it, Gregor. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Back it up, please. All right, so we're snapping from about the 19-yard line. So deep wings, you're on the goal line. You should be at the back edge of the white, straddling the goal line. And the area behind you needs to be clear as it is here. So if you need to back up to the track because you have that amount of traffic at the pylon, you're able to do it, and you're not giving up the goal line. Now, short wing. You may um, need to help 
provide information on a catch that goes to the sideline. Uh, you may have information that's instrumental, the, the player going out of bounds before touching. Uh, there are a number of pieces of information that you may have to assist. The thing that you have to make sure that you do is while you're moving downfield, make sure that at the mesh point, you're stationary. And if you, the furthest that you're going to go on this is going to be the five yard line. All right, so with that backdrop, let's let this run. So our deep wing is not in um, the ideal position. He's off of the goal line, comes up, incomplete. He's got incomplete out of bounds. But uh, if you follow the short wing, short wing just keeps right on coming like this is a five-person game. And this may be what happened. This may be typically a five person crew uh, and the short wing is not used to having a deep wing. Um, but regardless, this is a, well, it's a pretty big detail that we need to work through in our pregame so that we avoid these kinds of scenarios, all right? So what happens as a result of having difference of agreement in terms of whether this is a catch or a no catch. We'll get to the coach in just a minute, all right? Let's start with the point of view of what we need to do on this particular play, all right? So the deep wing has incomplete, short wing um, has a catch and a touchdown, all right? Referee is over there. Um, we may need to bring the back judge over there. Back judge, if you've got information, you need to come and bring it. But the questions that we need to ask would be, what made this pass incomplete? Or what made this pass uh, a completion for a touchdown, all right? And if you have people that start saying, well, it looked like, or I thought, right off the bat, they don't have definite information. We're looking for someone that can say, look, this is what happened. This is what is going to show up um, on film as being a correct call, all right? Now, if you can't get agreement between the two officials, whether it's deep wing back judge or short wing deep wing, you got to bring it to the referee. And this is one of those times where um, King David is going to have to split the baby, all right? So we're going to have to figure out referees what you're going to do on this particular play. And that's not an easy scenario, but that's why you wear the white hat. And ultimately you're gonna have to maybe judge, jury and executioner here. All right, so the other part of this is regardless of how this turns out, this coach has earned a UNS. He cannot be out of the box. Well, the only reason why he can be out of the box would be for an injured player after the play, um, or to come down the sideline to ask for a timeout when time is of the essence, those kinds of things. He's coming down to protest a call, all right? This is a foul. This is not a warning. It's a foul. However this turns out, there's a UNS that's attached to it. So something we definitely want to avoid uh, anytime, whether we're working a middle school game on a Wednesday night or the conference championship game this week or next week or a playoff game the following week or the state championship game in November. So a play to learn from. Make sure you talk about these things ahead of time. This is a reflection, not a reflection of, of good planning on the part of this crew. Regardless of what else we can talk about, five-person crew on a normal basis, whatever, we can't go into a game with these uncertainties. Okay, next clip. All right, now what I want you to notice is the line of scrimmage official at the very bottom left corner coming into the screen. We've got teams in position to play. I'm presuming that we've had a ready for play signal. Um, 
first of all, referees, before you make the ball ready for play after any sort of a delay, timeout, end of a quarter, whatever it happens to be, you need to kind of do a nose check and make sure that you've got everyone else in position ready to go. And if you don't, you don't give the ready for play signal. Now, let's just say for whatever reason it happens as it did here, you hear the ready for play signal and you're the short wing or the deep wing or the back judge or the umpire, or whatever you happen to be, and you know you're not where you're supposed to be, shut the game down. Blow your whistle, we'll reset, We'll reset the play clock. We'll give a new ready for play signal and we'll move on. Now, fortunately, this line of scrimmage person gets back there. But what opportunity did the short wing have to perform his pre-snap responsibilities? Is he even certain that he's got four, no more than four in the backfield? Probably not. Uh, has he been able to establish the neutral zone in terms of where it is and uh, other factors relative to having to make a decision on a false start or a DOF, whatever it might happen to be. So we can't play football under these terms and conditions. Don't let it happen. All right, next uh, play is going to be, uh, should be a punt down near the goal line. Stop the film. All right, pre-snap routine. Wherever you are on the field, we are snapping this ball from the 39 yard line. Football IQ tells you that the goal line could be in play. Doesn't matter how bad the punter is, right? Doesn't matter how bad or the wind is blowing. The goal line can be in play. So when in doubt, we always defend the goal line. So our deep wing at the top of the screen is starting at about the 11 yard line. Now, I, I don't know the, the thought process there. This may have been a substitute on this crew. Could be a number of factors that contribute here. But once again, before we go into a game, this is clip 150. So we played three and a half quarters at this point. Um, In-game adjustments, we by now we should have basic mechanics at least pretty well worked out. And back judges, you're the captain of the deep three. So there's no way that this play should begin with the deep wing standing at the 11 the yard line. Don't let it happen. O to O, um, take a couple steps over that way, get that official's attention, get him or her where they belong. We can't begin plays out of position. Now, go ahead and let it run. Now, the video is not very good. I will tell you that this ball hit uh, in about the 10, rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled and was about a yard uh, from hitting the pylon and went into the end zone. So there was good fortune on the part of the crew, good fortune on the part of the deep wing. In this particular case, let's just for giggles, let's say that that ball hit and now all of a sudden we've got a diamond cutter does this go out of bounds over the pylon does this go out of bounds before it gets to the pylon um how are we going to know and what credibility are we going to have to make that call when we're this far out of position good fortune was present in this particular case and we be, can be grateful for that but that's a mistake that is unacceptable at any time during the season. But clearly in week seven, um, there's just nowhere that we can go for that, particularly on clip 150, uh, which is late in the fourth quarter. All right, uh, next clip. This is going to be a field goal attempt, and this is uh, towards the end of regulation. If this kid makes this kick, they probably win the game. Um, now, first of all, we need to remember that field goals are completely different than PATs. A field goal attempt is a scrimmage kick that carries all of the scrimmage kick 
rules that go with it. So in this particular case, the kick is going to get blocked. So line of scrimmage at the bottom of the screen gets going. Now, I appreciate his thought that he's thinking that this could be reverse mechanics, um, and he wants to be on his way towards the goal line. So the thought process is good. However, we also need to consider that the neutral zone is pretty important right here, you know, um, because where this ball gets touched is going to determine who either retains the ball or who is going, you know, whose who's possession is going to be at the end of the play. So as long as this ball stays behind the line of scrimmage, uh, this is a free ball. So we could have a number of scenarios. One would be that a teammate player picks it up and runs for a first down. Another scenario would be that a teammate player picks it up and throws a legal forward pass to a teammate downfield. Also a possibility. Um, another scenario would be that a teammate player possesses the ball, begins to run, is hit, and fumbles. Free ball. Another scenario would be behind the line of scrimmage or ahead of the line of scrimmage uh, that team B gains possession of the ball. And now during their return, they fumble the ball. And then we know at the end of the play, whoever has it is going to have a new series first and 10. So we've, we've got to understand all of those principles and we've got to think of field goals just like we do punts because everything is identical. They line up identically. So something else we need to think about and perhaps uh, pregame this week. Okay, next clip. We're going to look at some really good uh, deep wing mechanics to wrap up tonight. Um, oh, we got a kick here first. Ah, okay. I forgot about this clip. I put this in on purpose. All right. So back this up. Now we get a flag down here, and presumably this is for KCI. All right. But now deep wings particularly when uh, the flyer is coming from your side of the field, you need to know how he gets to the kick returner. And what you're going to see here is that this teammate pushes that gold shirt into the kick returner. So this is a block in the back. It's, it's foul. But let's say that it was from the side and not a foul. That is still the responsibility of the teammate for putting the defender into the kick returner. This is not a foul for KCI. This is the fault of the teammate of the kick returner. So we get a flag down from the back judge. The deep wing, one or both, need to come in and need to provide some information to the back judge. Hey, you know, what do you have? Well, I have KCI. Well, all right, here's how that contact occurred. Uh, actually, I have a flag down because number such and such committed a block in the back uh, that caused the opponent to have contact with a kick returner. So you can pick up your flag for KCI and we're going to enforce my foul for IBB. Or if it's a side block, you're coming in to say, I hit a legal block by a teammate that put the opponent into contact with the kick returner. So we do not have a foul. And then what you're going to have is the referee to step in and to explain what happened. There's no foul for kick catch interference because the teammate blocked an opponent into the kick returner first down for whoever recovers the ball. And the other thing is we need to make sure we don't blow the whistle here. This is a live ball until someone gains firm control of it, right? So in the other scenario where you have a block in the back, um, you're, you're probably going to make two announcements. There's no foul for kick catch interference. Um, block in the back, number 22, um, receiving team, put the opponent into the kick returner, the block in the back will be enforced 10 yards from the spot of the foul first down. 
So that's what we need to do when we have the flag pick up. But we have to have that crew communication. That's the rules knowledge. That's the trust factor that has to be in play for our crews to be highly functional. Okay, next split. Hey, Rich, can I ask you a question on this one? Certainly. Um, should this be the yellow team, yellow jerseys team ball? Does it hit the white player and bounce off and then they recover? So an ideal situation well, would you apply? No, you're, 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 if, good point, Gregor. If you have possession by um, team A at the end of the down, then the only thing that, that we can do in terms of enforcement, um, check me if I'm wrong on this, uh, referees, but because this kick catch interference, it doesn't matter who has the ball at the end of the down, you're going to enforce from the spot of the foul. But because you've got um, a foul by uh, team B and team A ends up with the ball, the only place that you've got to enforce this foul is the previous spot. So if someone has something different, you know, chime in. But team A ends up with the ball. Okay, thank you. So theoretically, and that is that looks like that's fourth and about eight. So in that particular instance, um, the the foul by team B is going to give team A a first down, right? I Yeah, I think so. But if uh, if it did hit the white player and bounced off, then they would, what, decline the penalty and take the ball at the uh, where they recovered it down there? You're right. Because the foul is by team B. So team... Uh, Team A is going to decline this foul and accept possession of the ball. Okay, there's a good teaching point right there. We need to slow down and make sure that we have the principal parts of this all together and that we're thinking it through so that we make one announcement and it's all of the information and it's according to the enforcement. Okay, hey, it looks like Next. He, he blows it dead, though, so... I agree with everything, but since he blew it dead, that's like a tackle, right? The the play becomes dead, and there's no recovery. Well, it all depends when the whistle is uh, is blown. If if it in effect is an inadvertent whistle, then I believe we got to go back to the previous spot, replay the down, correct? Yes, if it's an inadvertent whistle. Well, Rich, I was going to just pipe in. If uh, they always say, if you have an inadvertent whistle, be thankful for the penalty. <laughs> so uh, it, then it will go back to your point where we'll go back to the previous uh, spot, okay, and uh, we'll enforce it from the original line of scrimmage and award the kicking team a first down if they had uh, uh, less than 10 yards to go. Yeah, that'll be an interesting announcement. Oh, it would definitely be an interesting announcement. <laughs> you know, I put this clip in for one specific purpose, but it, it really is a great teaching play and emphasizes a lot of important um, uh, pieces of information that we would have to consider to have the correct ruling at the end of the play. Now, the, the key would be, first of all, don't be in a hurry to blow your whistle because this is still a live ball. When you blow the whistle, you take away a lot of options. So better to have a really, really late whistle than to have one a split second too soon. Okay, we're going to wrap up with a couple of really good mechanical uh, read and react situations. You know, we've been working on that. That was one of our priorities this year. What we're going to get um, on this first clip, we're going to get a fade pattern, which we know is 
pretty common. Oop, wrong one. All right, so we'll get to that in a minute. This first one is we get a pattern that is run towards the sideline, and we have an interception because the ball is under throw. All right. Now, the good part is you can't see the deep wing until now. Deep wing comes up. Now, we don't need to drop a bean bag. Bean bag does not mean anything here. We don't need that. It's not one of the reasons to use the bean bag. This is just clear cut. It's an intercepted pass and belongs to team B. We need to stop the clock and give a new directional signal. But let's give credit to the deep wing on this side for having a good cushion. Also, our back judge in the middle of the field, you can see that there is a solid cushion there. Uh, we're able to make good decisions, read and react. Shoulders are squared to the sideline. Nice job. All right, next clip. All right, here's going to be the fade pattern previously mentioned. Comes from the slot guy, but you can see our, our deep wing reads it. He sees right away that his receiver has cut off the pattern, but here comes that slot guy, and he is nicely ahead of it. He's shuffling. Shoulders are square to the sideline. He is in great position to make a good ruling on this which in this particular case was pretty simple. It was just an incomplete pass. But we're on the move. We're on the move. If this is caught, he's going to get to the goal line prior to the receiver getting there. So if we have a tough decision either at the pylon or near the goal line, he's going to be there. So nice job. All right, next clip. Same game, same deep wing. Trips to the top. And we get a fade pattern this time. And you can see that the defensive back is not playing the ball. Early contact. Good call for DPI. And we get the flag out. We're not concerned about getting the flag at the precise spot. This is clearly more, you know, this is well downfield. So we've got a 15-yard foul. He just gets it out there. But this becomes, I don't want to say it's a simple play, but it becomes much easier to make key determinations if you have a good cushion. You know, this is a person either that has had previous training or is a regular participant in this program and has learned the value of those shoulders square to the sideline with a good cushion. Nice job. All right, next clip. All right, this is going to go to the right side of the screen. Deep wing, right where the deep wing belongs. Um, I believe that is uh, a young lady. Nice to see uh, uh, ladies out on the field. And she is goal line extended, doesn't move, waits for the play to finish, confirms that we have all principal parts of a catch in play and then very calmly signals a score. Very, very well done. One, two, three, four steps in bounds. Firm control, not gonna worry about the ball on the turf there. We're certainly not gonna nitpick that. Okay, next clip. Um, you know, we've been talking all year about our preparation. We've been talking about the importance of communication. We've been talking about being anticipatory in terms of things that might happen that theoretically we shouldn't expect, whether it's a double pass, whether it's um, a double reverse, uh, a transcontinental pass on a punt return, those kinds of things. Um, hopefully don't totally catch us off guard. Now, sure, there are going to be times where um, we might be surprised, but we want to try to limit those to whatever degree possible. So your crew communication, like anyone on the crew can say, hey, heads up, this, this could be something unusual. This might be a trick play. 
but we know that the trick plays that like, for instance, the transcontinental pass occurred in the second quarter of a game. So uh, they can happen any time and they are reflective of the fact that the coaches have had these guys in camp since August and to keep it interesting, they've done some things that are kind of unusual. Um, and again, particularly if you've got teams that don't have a lot to play for, they're going to bring out those kinds of things. So uh, we just have to be prepared and, and know that um, we're going to handle them to the best of our ability. The, the final thought that I have tonight is uh, as we go through the last two weeks of the regular season and into the playoffs, at the end of the game, let's not have regrets. Let's not regret that we didn't speak up, that we didn't go to the referee and say, can we talk about it, that enforcement just a minute? I want to make sure that we're doing it right. Like, for instance, the, the play that we talked about in terms of um, being blocked into the kick returner, you know, that would be one that you'd maybe not be directly involved in it, but you would listen to it and you would go, oh boy, that just doesn't seem right to me. Then you would go and you would say, can we talk this through one more time? I just want to make sure that we're considering everything that we need to before we enforce this foul. An extra 15, 20 seconds might save the crew. Let's not have regrets in terms of throwing a flag that we didn't see beginning to end. Uh, you know, you can put a lot of tentacles into the regret factor. All I'm saying to you is when you walk away from the game, when you're in the car on the way home or you're in the shower or whatever it happens to be, let's not regret that we did or we didn't do something that we know that we should or we shouldn't have done. So with that, all the best. Uh, weather should be really nice Friday night, so enjoy that game, and let's be the best team on the field. Thanks, everyone. Good night.